coming up on the Ultimate Health Podcast. You know, I can remember a therapy session that I had. It just came to my understanding and to my realization that I was just completely addicted to doing. Whether it be doing drugs or doing work or looking for women or whatever, I just at my core, I was just an addict. Just trying to do anything I could. It's on two different levels of feeling, like everything I could in order to feel because I wanted to feel alive. But at the same time, I was doing everything I could in order to not feel the stuff that actually needed to be felt. Hello and welcome to the Ultimate Health Podcast, episode 375. I'm Jesse Chappis, and I'm here to take your health to the next level. Each week, I'll bring you in-depth conversations with health and wellness leaders from around the world. This week, I'm chatting with James Sebastiano. He's a marketing expert and conscious entrepreneur that's passionate about ethical and environmentally sustainable business. He's the co-founder of the world-renowned vegan restaurant in Bali, Alchemy. James is the subject of the film Chasing the Present that's now available on Apple TV, among other online platforms. And this movie was just released on September 29th. It's a phenomenal watch. I got to watch it before chatting with James, and I highly recommend it. The plot of this movie is that James is a materially successful young man who's riddled with anxiety, so he embarks on a worldwide journey of self-inquiry. He immerses himself in meditation and plant medicine and converses with top experts like Russell Brand, Graham Hancock, Joseph Goldstein, and more to find the root cause of the problem and learn how to finally find freedom from his crippling anxiety. James finds answers to why a person who seemingly has it all can continue to suffer from debilitating panic attacks. Again, it's a great movie. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend going and checking it out. Some of the highlights from our conversation are how overdosing on cocaine led to a big epiphany, being fully present is the most powerful medicine, the fear of death versus the fear of living, the challenging conversation that brought James and his dad closer, and integrating a spiritual journey into everyday life. This is a powerful conversation and movie that can impact everybody in a positive way. So please be sure and share the movie, share this interview with the people in your life, and I thank you ahead of time. Without further ado, here I go with James Sebastiano. James, welcome to the podcast. How are you doing today? Good, man. How are you? Thank you so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. Well, it's an honor to chat with you. I really appreciate your time. And you just mentioned before we jumped on the call, you made a, a serious road trip and just made it to Colorado in time for our chat. So I really appreciate that. Yeah, I, I went actually um, with my father. Uh, I went and picked him up in Florida. And then I drove back from Florida to Colorado over the last, we left on Thursday. And it's Monday now, I think. <laughs> so it's been, it was quite an epic journey, for sure. And if you've seen the movie, you can imagine I was just in the van with my my family for five days. So, <laughs> well, I mean, and also the fact that layering on your film just launched, I think it was, it was at the end of last week, September 29th. So, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of press and different things happening with the film coming out. So you, you got a lot on your plate. Yeah, for sure. It was definitely bad timing for a road trip. I, I didn't really think about it too much. I was like every day I had to pull over and I was doing a podcast or an interview or something like, which I'm super grateful and super stoked about for sure. But it was a bit challenging on the road trip and being somewhere like, okay, it's 1.30 and I have to go for an hour and a half and do this talk, you know. But it was cool and we made it back and everybody's healthy and we got to see a lot of this beautiful country and cruise around. And I'm, yeah, I'm grateful to be back here in Colorado. So was the family like on a vacation staying with you for a bit or what does that look like? My dad and my brother are here. My mom and my sister are still in Florida, but my dad and my brother are here. My dad's going to be here for a week and then he's going to fly back. Well, I want to congratulate you. Chasing the present, got to watch the film before this, and you guys just did a phenomenal job. And I know this film's going to impact a lot of people in a positive way. So big congrats. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm really glad that you enjoyed it. And I want to start this discussion, you know, going back in your story a little bit. And I think it was about age 15 where your anxiety began to creep in in a significant way. So take us back to that point and talk about what was going on in your life. That's when it really started to be visible for me when I started to notice it. But before that, you know, I had a the, the childhood that I had and, and I grew up in, in an American society. And I think there were a lot of things that attributed to my anxiety, this feeling of not being good enough and needing to keep up and needing to succeed and not being able to fully express myself. You know, all those things definitely were a major contribution to growing up and having anxiety. But when I was 15 or 16, I got stung by a wasp. I was I had like a little job. I was painting somebody's house for them. And I went out to the shed to get a, some more paint. And when I opened the shed door, a wasp just stung me on my finger. 
And um, I was also super high at the time. I just smoked like five joints or something. And I was just painting and I went out to, to get the paint and I was on like really high and I'm sitting there on the couch. And then all of a sudden I look at my hand and it's just super swollen, like to the point where I couldn't even, you couldn't tell that my fingers were moving when I tried to move them. I was like, oh, this isn't good. And then I started to feel like, oh, I can't breathe. And I went in the mirror and looked at myself and my head was swollen and I took off my shirt and I was just covered in hives. And I was like, oh my God. I told my friend, I got to go to the hospital now. On the way there, I kind of was in and out of consciousness and passed out. And then I remember getting thrown in a wheelchair and pushed in the back of the hospital. And then the next thing you know, I'm jumping out of a hospital bed because they um, jabbed me with an epinephrine adrenaline needle. And I shot out of the hospital bed and I had these machines hooked up to me. And I can remember like stuff falling down and it was really crazy. And from that point on, in combination with that and all the things that have happened prior in my life, I really started to suffer from anxiety. I was having panic attacks. And that week after that adrenaline was still in my system and I felt like my brain started to work differently. And it was really just really a strange time. You know, it was really uncomfortable. And I didn't really know how to deal with it. And I told my parents like, hey, I, I feel real weird. And uh, my mom kind of snuck me to the doctor because my dad wouldn't have been cool with that. And they gave me a prescription medicine and I took one dose of it. And it was the weirdest experience of my life. So I never took it. But again, after that, Further on in my life, I started to take, you know, I'd buy Xanax and Valium and Percocets and all kinds of prescription pills off the street from friends, whatever. And I was just taking that stuff by the handful and smoking, you know, ounce after ounce of weed and just drinking bottles on the, like a Friday night, I would just drink a whole bottle of Jack Daniels, Saturday, Wednesday, you know. And uh, yeah, so I just self-medicated my way through, through my teens, essentially, and my early 20s. And other than the drugs and alcohol, did you have any other means to you know, relieve the anxiety, other outlets? From a healthy standpoint, I played sports. You know, I was doing this stuff, but I was also a very good athlete. And I played baseball, basketball, soccer, tennis. I ran track. I was in, I did acting and drama class and that kind of stuff as well. So I was pretty much doing everything. You know, I didn't think like, I didn't even know that what I had was anxiety at that time. I just know I felt super bad. And I was having these panic attacks and I started to research and I was like, oh, maybe, maybe I'm having panic attacks. I never searched out help or therapy or anything like that i just kept you know trying to hide it and and trying to um, cover it up with with all these different means and i think it was around age 20 where you ended up overdosing on cocaine was that the big epiphany moment for you for sure yeah i was some i don't know the exact age i was somewhere between 20 and 22 and yeah that was a big epiphany moment i came out of that just like what the fuck is going on in my life? I had a busted elbow, a busted knee, you know, when I when I woke up from that experience and it was it was a really horrible experience. And um yeah, it was it was tough. And I came out of that experience and I, I was kind of living in an apartment by myself at the time. Actually I had a roommate at the time, but then I was living by myself and within three months of that happening I said, you know, I can't stay here in the States anymore. The friends I'm hanging out with, the stuff I'm doing, it's really not working for me. And if I continue on this path, I'm gonna die hundred percent. So I sold my car, I got like four or 5,000 bucks, and I moved to Amsterdam, <laughs> um, which I make this joke on every podcast that I do, but it's just so funny to me looking back at my life to think like, I just overdosed on cocaine, let me sell my stuff and move to Amsterdam in the hopes of like getting away from drugs, you know? What was it about Amsterdam that brought you in? You know, it was, uh, I had been there before once with some buddies during college, we went there for a week or two. And I had never been outside of America prior to that. And that was the only place I'd been. And it was so liberal. And, and I grew up in Florida, you know, which is a super conservative, traditional, um, you know, state. So going there and seeing Europe and Europeans and how they live life and all that kind of stuff was just super cool to me, you know? I was like, wow, this is, this is nice. I want to I experience this. So being there, I was like, okay, I'm going to do this. And um, I got there. I spent all my money in like a month that I had saved. And then I was just kind of bouncing around from hostel to hostel and um, sleeping on couches and just had nothing. And, you know, um, I couldn't really call my parents and, and ask them for money because I didn't want them to know I failed. And also don't come from a wealthy family, you know, at that time, uh, normal middle class family. I had everything I need for sure and wanted when I was growing up. But my dad definitely wouldn't have sent me, you know, he wouldn't have kept paying for me to live in Amsterdam. So I had to figure it out on my own or I had to go home and, and go back to the way that I was before. So I decided to stay. and. You know, I was pretty low, at low points. I was walking on the streets looking for coins so I could eat, you know, Burger King or whatever. And I was working in a bar and trying, my job was trying to convince people to go out in a bar or trying to convince people to do pub crawls, you know? 
And I actually started to get good at it. was good at sales and I started to make some money and I found myself being able to chip in and get my own apartment with some people. And then all of a sudden I met a girl and uh, I listened to a lot of people's stories and that's always, there's always somehow a girl involved, you know, and it can be a really good turning point or it can be a very bad turning point. <laughs> but for me, she was amazing. Uh, it was like an angel came into my life and um, we were together and I moved in with her and I remember for Christmas morning, she gave me a book and it was called Skinny Bastard. So I read it. I was like, are you saying I'm fat or what? <laughs> I wasn't fat, but anyway, it was a funny title. And I read it. And at the end of the book, it said, hey, try to become a vegetarian for 30 days. That's it. Just do this for 30 days. I'm like, oh, okay, well, I'll try. I can do anything, I think, for 30 days. Why not? So I did it. And it lasted like 11, 12 years now, you know, uh, on that same path of being a vegetarian. And, and for me, that was the first time in my life where I started to become aware. You know, I think people approach awareness or start to think about or start to feel aware through different ways. You know, there's many different ways, many different paths to that. But for me, it was vegetarianism because it, it was the first time I started to think about what I was putting in my body. And I started to be aware, like, oh, if I'm drinking these green juices and eating this healthy food and then I'm going and doing drugs and getting drunk every single day, this isn't making sense, you know? So I'd be at the bar at like four o'clock in the morning with like a liter and a half of green juice and just sitting there like drinking it and everybody, all my friends at the bar making fun of me and stuff, taking tequila shots. And of course, once in a while, I'd have like a tequila shot and I would chase it with green juice or whatever. But um, yeah, it was like that. And, and, uh, and that's kind of slowly how I started to change. So your girlfriend at the time, was she already vegetarian or did she jump on this 30 day challenge with you? She was a vegetarian. But I don't, rem I don't think she wasn't a vegetarian the whole time we dated. She became a vegetarian while we were dating. And I was still eating steaks and stuff. And we'd go out and, and I would eat a steak and she would have a salad. And she didn't pressure me at all in any way. She just gave me a book one day. Yeah, check this out. Because I would ask her questions like, oh, why are you doing this? You know, whatever, blah, blah, blah. But she was super cool. And she didn't, um, she didn't pressure me at all. And what do you think it was about that book that really caught your attention and made you take it seriously? Well, there was a lot of books mentioned in that book. And then I kind of, oh, what's this book? What's that book? What's this book? And I wrote them down and I would buy those books and then read those books. But it was the challenge, actually, I think. I like this idea of this 30-day challenge. Like, can I do this for 30 days? Yeah, I can try it. And yeah, so the challenge of, of that really, um, it was interesting for me. And you mentioned how this was like a direct conflict with the way you had been living up to that point, going to bars, drinking and stuff like that. But within that 30 days, did you actually notice a significant difference in how your mind was working and, and how your body felt? You know, I don't think I did. And I don't, I don't know. Uh, you know, I've done a lot of studying and about health. And I, I own a bunch of vegan restaurants and juice bars and yoga places and all that kind of stuff now. So I'm pretty into it. And, um, you know, I think in the first year or two even, you might feel worse, you know, coming onto a vegetarian diet because your body starts to cleanse itself and detox. And a lot of people mistake cleansing with oh, this isn't working for me, you know, because when we start to eat clean and drink clean juices and eat clean food, our body starts to release the toxins that we've been storing for all the years up to that point. So that can really get confusing for people and they might just drop the diet because they think like, oh, this sucks. I'm getting sick all the time, you know, but actually it's your body cleaning itself. And how long did you guys end up staying in Amsterdam? I lived in Amsterdam like three or four years. What was the journey out of there? What, you know, clued in for you that it was time to make a move and, and head in a different direction. I did a talk from this famous raw foodie called David Wolf. He came to Amsterdam and did a talk. So I went to David Wolf's talk. And at the talk, I found on the ground, actually, there was a flyer and it was a brochure. It said to go to Bali for a 30-day detox uh, raw chef training juice cleanse. I was like, oh, okay, I've never done juice cleanse. Let's try this. And my girl, hey, you want to go to Bali at some point? Like, yeah. So we saved that little flyer and we went to Bali. And while we were in Bali, we just fell in love with it and thought like, wow, this place is amazing, like much better than Amsterdam in the winter. And the Balinese people are so beautiful and there's so much opportunity here. You know, at that time, there wasn't a juice bar in, in the Ubud, which is the town where I built mine. It's like, wow, they're all over America. They're starting to pop up in Europe and Bali. There's nothing. And there's all these people going there for healing and stuff like that. So we decided to go there and, uh, and we packed all of our stuff in Amsterdam and, and we, went to, we went to Bali. So was it hard to get whatever papers you needed or whatnot to actually make that move to a different country? No, it wasn't. Bali's pretty easy. You can go there and get a business visa or a tourist visa or a working permit. As long as you're doing everything correctly, it's, Bali's pretty open to foreigners coming in and, and starting business. So was alchemy your first business you started when you got there? 
Yeah, it was my first business I started when I got there. I um, I met a guy, a super cool guy, and he, he believed in me and he wanted to be my business partner. So we made like a deal and said, okay, go for it. So my girlfriend and I started working full time, full power. And I was just behind the bar making juice and she was at home, you know, making chocolates. And we were teaching the Balinese people about green juices and chocolates. And then we opened and it just exploded. You know, from day one, it was packed. The place was full and it was this tiny place, you know, about six or 700 square feet. And it was like $200 a month rent, you know, that's what we were paying. And, um, and it just slowly expanded. And while it was expanding and because of its success, I met a lot of people, you know, um, and while I was there, people kept kind of coming to me. Hey, James, you know, this is a great place. Do you want to do this? Hey, James, do you want to do that? Hey, James, do you want to do this? And I just kind of said yes to everything. And then for a period of, you know, five or six years, I was now up to doing like almost 46 or 45 businesses and had all these different partners and all these different projects going. I was really successful financially and uh, was in, you know, a relationship. And um, I was just like, oh, this is great. But at the same time, I was still suffering. You know, I was still having anxiety. I was still having panic attacks. And actually, it was getting worse. It got to the point, you know, where even getting in a car freaked me out. And I couldn't drive on the highway without having a full-blown, you know, panic attack. And I didn't get it. It wasn't clicking for me. Like, what's going on? How could I have money and relationship and businesses that are helping other people and all this kind of stuff, but still be suffering inside myself? So I got to a place where I, I built uh, like a vegan hotel, you know, and it went really well. And it got to the point where I didn't need to be there anymore. I kind of had a lot of f- some freedom at that point. I re- all the projects I were was working on were kind of running themselves and I had to check in, but I felt like a nice breath of air. And I had a friend who's an amazing filmmaker, Mark Waters. He's the director and the lead cinematographer of Chasing the Present. And I said to Mark, like, you know, one day I woke up and I had this, I can't explain it, how, how it feels, but it was just a clear knowing that I needed to make a documentary. I had no idea about what, but it took over every cell in my body. You know, I felt like I was burning. It's like a passion, like this radiating connection of just like, I need to do this. So I called him and I said, hey, Mark, like, I know it sounds crazy, but I really feel with every piece of myself that we need to make a film together. And he's like, man, I, I felt the same thing. He's like, what do you want to do? I was like, I have no idea, but let's just start. And he's like, okay, I'm in. So he came over and we started brainstorming, like, what kind of film should we make? I don't know. You know, it seems like there's two forces in the world. You know, there's fear and there's love and this and that. Maybe we should do something like that. So we started for like a month or two, like brainstorming together, thinking about what this film could be about. But while we were doing that, I was still suffering. I was still having panic attacks. I was still reacting like and snapping on people and just all this stuff. And it was like, wait a second. You know, I've already done, went down the path of making businesses to help other people, but I'm still suffering inside of myself. So why don't we just try to understand our own suffering and try to get to the root cause of anxiety and these mental health issues that I'm dealing with and just do whatever we can to get to the root of that and understand it. And let's just film that. Let's just capture that. Let's just share that in the most authentic way that we possibly can. And if we do it correctly, hopefully it will inspire other people to want to look into themselves as well. And that's how the filmmaking journey started for us. Well, it's definitely a great idea. A lot I want to unpack there as well. Starting with actually Bali was the place my wife and I went on our honeymoon two years ago. And we landed in the airport. We had a driver pick us up. And the first place we went to was Alchemy. Oh, cool. We got there late at night and, and we were looking for a meal before we got dropped off at our a place we were staying. And we, we picked up Alchemy on the way. And we ended up going to Alchemy a handful of times throughout that trip, our honeymoon. And when was this? What this was, was this? 2018, Okay, cool. about this time. So about September, October. So a couple years ago. And um, Alchemy was definitely one of the places that we've been recommending since. And, and it was a hot, one of the highlights of, of that trip. So just wanted to throw that out there. Awesome. Yeah, I'll send you a cookbook. I'd love you to have one. That'd be amazing. Thank you. And you talked about transitioning from, well, over a period of time, you transition from the drugs to working super hard. It seems like maybe the work kind of filled a void that was there when you quit the drugs. Do you know what I'm saying? Was there kind of a pivot there where you had this void where no more drugs in my life, but I still have this void and now I'm filling it with work. Did that kind of happen for you in, in that transition phase? For sure. You know, I can remember a therapy session that I had and I just came to my um, understanding and to my realization that I was just completely addicted to doing, whether it be doing drugs or doing work or 
looking for women or whatever. I just, at my core, I was just an addict in a sense, just on every sense, actually, just trying to do anything I could. It's like on, it's on two different levels of feeling like everything I could in order to feel because I wanted to feel alive. But at the same time, I was doing everything I could in order to not feel the stuff that actually needed to be felt. So anything I can do to distract myself and to build layers on top of the emotions that I need to experience in my life, I would do. And of course, it was subconscious, you know, and, and stuff like that. And, um, and we don't know, you know, now there's these books in the last few years coming out about emotional intelligence and, and all this kind of thing. But that's not something that they teach us in school. It's not something that my parents sat down with me when I was younger and said, hey, this is how you be emotionally intelligent. Like, this is how you feel your feelings. This, you know, like, it's just not how I was raised. And I don't know many people. I only know very few people who are actually raised in an emotionally intelligent way where they actually have the tools to be able to cope with life and to be able to, to feel their way through life. And I definitely didn't. And I'm only now, you know, in the last in the last several years starting to understand this stuff and starting to to feel it and and starting to re look at and revisit the way that I that I experience my life and when the drugs aren't in the picture and the work comes out of the picture at least the overworking how have you been able to tame that down like what knowing what you know now and knowing how you're using those as tools to tame the anxiety what do you have as a healthy measure in place now instead you know, I do a lot of meditation. I think for me, meditation was the key thing to overcoming my anxiety. I do a lot of exercise and sport and running and mountain biking. And so I just replace them with healthy, with healthy things, with healthy activities. Let's talk about Mark. And it sounds like you guys were already close when you decided to do the film. How did you first meet? Was it like, was it on the island of Bali or how did you guys come in contact? We came into contact. He was in Bali at that time uh, making another documentary called The Salt Trail, which is, if you have a chance to see it, it's a beautiful documentary that he made on his own with a 5D. He did the whole thing with uh, he and his girlfriend. It's really, really amazing. So he was in Bali shooting some surfing there for his documentary. And we met because one of the surfers that he was filming with was my roommate. And um, he needed a place to stay. You know, he didn't have very much money at the time. And he kind of, him and his girl needed a place to crash so that they could finish the edit of the film. And I only you know, knew him for a little while, but I said, hey man, I'm not going to be in town. Just stay in my house. You guys can crash there as much as you want and just do your editing there. So from that point forward, we just became super close and, and we became really good friends. And these days, I know right now you're in Colorado. How much of your time do you spend in Bali? I spent a lot of time in Bali. I mean, during the filmmaking process, I was obviously traveling a lot. But prior to that, I was there like eight months a year and and even this year, I was there a lot already. I was there, you know, February, March, April, May, June, and half of July. And then I came to the States in the middle of July. You mentioned opening Alchemy and how all of a sudden people were piling in and it was a success right away. What was the vegetarian scene in Bali like at the time when you opened that restaurant? Because now when we went a couple of years ago, there was a huge vegetarian scene. There's a lot of great restaurants. And for somebody that eats a plant-based diet, it's definitely a Mecca where you can find endless places to eat at for sure it's always been kind of a mecca i think right now there's more vegetarian restaurants per square foot than anywhere else in the world that's actually like a fact um, especially in ubud but um at the time our, our restaurant's a little bit unique because we were a raw vegan organic restaurant so it's not just vegetarian we were the first 100 percent raw vegan restaurant on the island um, so that gave us a little bit of a niche and we didn't have to compete so much with the fried veggie burgers and stuff like that. We we're just pretty much making salads and lots of chocolates and juices and smoothies and that kind of stuff. And does raw vegan food make up a big part of your diet today? It depends where I am. When I'm in Bali, huge part of my diet because it's so hot there. But when I'm here, I'm in Colorado and in the winter, like I eat, I do still eat salads and stuff, but I don't crave fruit and salads as much as I do when it's cold. I prefer to eat a lot of soups and stuff like that, you know? And warm food. I love Beyond Burgers. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> They're pretty good, you know. So I definitely eat my fair share of those things as well. <laughs> but you're still vegetarian. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah, caveat to that, though. I did eat fish a few times. I was vegan, very strict. I was raw vegan, very strict for a time period. And I was vegetarian, like without having a morsel of anything for over 10 years. And then all of a sudden, I was in Hawaii and um, I had three nights in a row where I had a dream that I was eating fish. And it's super weird for me because in my life, even before I was a vegetarian, I didn't like fish. I didn't eat fish ever. 
So I was like, what's going on? Why am I dreaming three days in a row that I need to eat fish? And I was like, I don't know. Maybe I'm going to try to order some fish. So I went to, I went to like the best place I could find and I ordered a piece of fish and I said, I was like, it was like such a battle in my mind for so long to order it or not order it or what do I do? And, uh, and I decided to, I was like, I'm just going to order it. So I ordered it and I ate it and I ate fish a few times after that because it's, I don't know, something happened when I ate the fish and I know you can get everything from vitamins or whatever, but because of the fact that I had three dreams in a row that I, that I was eating fish, I was like, I don't know, I guess I got to eat fish. This is crazy. But I felt something turn on in my brain. It was a really crazy experience that I can't explain. And I had a hard time sleeping the first night. And I felt really clear and really energized. So I just think I was at a little phase where I needed, I don't know, maybe omegas or something like that, you know, fish oil, something like that for my brain. And my dreams were telling me. So I just kind of went with it. So do you periodically have fish still or is that out of the diet again? No, I don't. I feel like it's out of the diet. I feel like it's out of the diet. But it sounds like you're going to listen to your body. If if you get another sign like that and noticing how that had such an impact on how you felt, I'm sure, you, well, I'm not sure, but I'm guessing you'd be open to listening to your body. I think that's the most important part. And it's hard to know what is your body and what is your mind and what is your belly, right? It's very hard to distinguish the difference. But that was pretty clear, like three dreams in a row about eating fish. Like, okay, I get the point, you know? <laughs> Especially as somebody that never liked fish in the past. It wasn't like a craving or whatnot. Yeah, exactly. So when you decide you're going to be the main subject of the film and you're going to go into your life and, and have cameras on you and be sharing your feelings and, and your healing journey, this is a vulnerable time and a, a vulnerable healing number of years that you're going through here. Was that intimidating to you when you made that decision you're going to be you know, the star of the movie? No, it was a, no, I don't think it was intimidating. It, it was challenging in moments like, you know, in the film where I'm having a therapy session, you know, I had a full blown one hour therapy session and there's like six or seven different people in the room filming, doing audio and lights and all that kind of stuff. And here I am trying to like release some deep traumatic stuff that that's stored. So there were definitely moments throughout the film where I was like, wow, this is, um, this is a challenge. And there were also moments where I felt uncomfortable, like, you know, we're at a yoga teacher training and there's 52 people at the yoga teacher training and then there's cameras kind of like following me around. Everybody's looking at me like I'm like weird, you know, like what's going on with this guy, you know? And then we're at ayahuasca in Peru in the Amazon jungle and there's people there that have cancer and that are really battling with serious, serious issues. And it's so sensitive, you know, we were getting vibes from people like, ah, get the camera away, like that kind of thing, you know? So everywhere we went actually, and everything we did in the film was super sensitive. We weren't filming like a baseball game or something like that. You know, we were filming places where people go to release deep emotional traumas. So everywhere we went, it was that that part was a bit uncomfortable. But for me to be in the film and stuff like that, I at a certain point, and also because Mark and I are such good friends, at a certain point, I just kind of blocked out the fact that the cameras were there. I was just kind of being myself. I think you'd have to. It would end up driving you crazy over time and you wouldn't be able to produce this real raw piece of art that you guys did that is going to be so touching and impactful to people. Definitely. You mentioned meditation earlier. I'm curious, when did your meditation practice start and what did it look like in the beginning and how has that evolved over the years? Well, it started, the first time I dabbled into meditation was a couple months after I became a vegetarian, you know. I quickly was like, oh, what's meditation? And, well, and I would do a little bit here and there, you know, a day, and then like three months later, oh, maybe I should try to meditate again. So throughout this filmmaking process, I really incorporated it and made it a part of my life where it becomes, I, I still wouldn't say I wake up and the first thing that I do every day is meditate. That wouldn't be honest. But a lot of days are like that. And it's also more intuitive for me where I don't need to just do it as soon as I wake up. Like there'll be like a middle of the day where I feel the calling of like, oh, I need to meditate now and I'll go sit down and meditate for 30 minutes or 45 minutes or 15 minutes or whatever. So I think, you know, throughout the course of the years, it's just become more consistent and more regular and more of something that I really feel like called to do because it's really helped me, you know, and, and not only that, like I don't see anymore. I used to see meditation as just this picture of someone sitting with their legs crossed and their eyes closed and their fingers like this and just like that's it. And that is meditation from the purest definition. But, you know, like in the Bible, for example, it says to pray without ceasing. And I think that's a really interesting line in the Bible. And, and for me, that's what I, I think about when I think about meditation. Like how do we take that meditation practice into everything we do all day long? You know, how do we, when we're having a panic attack, 
and our mind is telling us that we're going to die and we're freaking out and we have all these crazy thoughts. How do we meditate in that moment to be able to distance ourselves from our thoughts and to be able to watch those thoughts? Because for me, that's what ended my anxiety was the ability to take that meditation practice into my daily life, you know, into the moments where I experience anxiety and, and into just moments where I, I would normally just maybe freak out and react on somebody. But instead of doing that, having the awareness and the ability to be able to watch that reaction rise and then watch it go away as opposed to just letting it come up and take me. You know, so I think my meditation practice has evolved in that sense of like um, doing my best to incorporate it into everything that I do as opposed to just meditating for 10 minutes in the morning and then leaving everything that I just learned behind until the next day when I meditate for 10 minutes again. And I'm just curious, how does that happen? Is it just part of doing it in an isolated form, like 10 minutes in the morning? And then when you get into those difficult situations throughout the day, it becomes a tool that kind of comes to you and, and you use it? Or is there different cues that you need to set up in your life that you're remembering to you know include presence throughout your day? I think for everybody it's different, but I think meditation, you know, from a mindfulness standpoint, meditation is more like tra brain training, you know? And if we keep training our brains to watch the thoughts when they arise throughout the day, when thoughts arise, whether they be good thoughts or bad thoughts or whatever, we're training our brain to learn how to watch those thoughts as opposed to reacting to them and as opposed to letting them take us down the rabbit hole that they so badly want to take us down. So, um, yeah, there's, I don't, I don't have any cues or anything. It's more just like it just happens in the moment and it's because of practice, really. I do think those those hours and hours and hours of practice that we do of meditating, that's why it's called the practice, you know, because we're practicing in those moments for real life situations. And how do we take that practice and, and use it when we're playing the game? Um, and and that, that question really inspires me. Now I'm going to take a quick break from my chat with James to give a shout out to our show partner, Organifi. The Organifi Red Juice is a superfood berry punch that tastes incredible. By drinking it, you'll increase your energy and antioxidant intake. It contains cordyceps, rhodiola, Siberian ginseng, reishi mushroom, acai, beets, pomegranate, and four berries. To make a red juice, all you do is mix a scoop of the red juice powder into some filtered water, give it a quick stir or shake, and it's ready to go. It's organic, gluten-free, soy-free, vegan, and keto-friendly. And as a listener of the show, you get 20% off your Organifi purchase by going to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash Organifi. Again, that URL is ultimahealthpodcast.com slash Organifi. And Organifi is spelled O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I. The Organifi Red Juice is a delicious way to keep you hydrated. Now I'm going to give a shout out to our other show partner, Beekeepers Naturals. Bee Elixir Brain Fuel is one of my staples. It provides me with caffeine-free energy and boosts my thinking power and productivity. Each box of Bee Elixir contains six vials of brain fuel. They can last anywhere between 6 and 18 uses depending on your specific needs. Here's what Beekeepers recommends. A third of a vial for daily support and maintenance, a half a vial for upgraded performance, and one full vial for peak brain power. I personally consume a whole vial each time I crack one open, but I'm a pretty extreme person. You'll have to play with it and see what works for you. And as a listener of the show, you get 15% off your beekeepers purchase by going to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash beekeepers. Again, that's ultimahealthpodcast.com slash beekeepers. Try these natural productivity shots that support clear thinking and deep focus without caffeine or sugar. And now back to my chat with James. So would you say the biggest thing it does for you is allow you to to be in the present throughout your days. Uh, well, first of all, I'm going to say I'm not always I'm not always present throughout all of my days. Not always, but, uh, but better at doing it. It's a tool and a practice that allows you. The title of the film, "Chasing the Present." Yeah. Would you say this is your most powerful tool for getting into the present moment in general throughout your days? I think meditation and or being in nature. I find being in nature and spending time in nature to be a very powerful tool to being in the present. It's less distracting, you know, try to be present in Times Square in New York City. It's like, you know, every there's like literally a million things grabbing your attention and trying to get you to do anything but be present, as opposed to when you're in the woods, you know, I really like being in the forest, I really like lakes, I really love climbing, and just being in those situations where you're just surrounded by presence, where you're just totally connected to 
to your nature and to and to the nature of the earth is um, is also a very very powerful way to be present. You know, and I don't surf, but Marx is an amazing surfer. You know, the director. For him, surfing is one of the most amazing ways that he finds to be present because you have to fully be in that moment in order to surf. You know, you can't be anywhere else. You can't be thinking about anything else or doing anything else. You have to be fully focused and being present in order to ride that wave, you know? And it's a really great metaphor for life. It sounds a lot like flow, being in the flow. 100%. I mean, I think that's what being in the flow is. In my opinion, being in the flow and being present are the exact same thing. That makes sense. And for your own self, you know, going through the journey you've been through and talking to all the different gurus you have when you put this film together, why is being in the present so important? I have to say, I think that that was the main teaching of the film, that when I went, we went to so many different cultures and we spoke to so many different teachers and shamans and, you know, wise elders and all different kinds of people from all different walks of life. And I think that was the common thread. Those were the two common threads, like being present and spending time in nature. If I had to pick two things from the different religions we study and everything, those two things are like there. They're like fundamental in everything. And I think the reason why it's so important is because, you know, in, in those moments of presence, we're just fully here. You know, when we're distracted or when we're not present, we're thinking about the future or we're thinking about the past. And, you know, when we're thinking about the future, there's so many things that can go wrong in the future, right? It's like, it doesn't exist yet. It's there. Like, what can go wrong? Oh, my God, what's happening with the coronavirus? Am I going to get it? Is my grandma going to die? Am I going to get my job back? Or my business is going to be able to reopen? I mean, all the worry and concern is in that moment. Like, in this very instant right now, we don't have that. You know, if we're just engrossed in the present moment, and that's all that we are, and that's all that we're feeling, it's perfect in that moment. It's peaceful. It's peaceful. And if we can surrender to that moment and if we can let go of everything else and just fully exist in the present moment, you know, I really feel like every minute that we're fully, fully present is like medicine. And I think it's the most powerful medicine in the world. And throughout your journey, starting back, you know, when you started, I know your journey goes back beyond that, but when you started this film to where you are today, would you say there's a significant difference in the amount of time throughout the day you're spending in the present moment? Definitely. For sure. For sure. And of course, like, you know, things come up and I think about the future, but it's those things. It's like, it's life is meditation, really. There's no, that's exactly what life is. It's, it's meditation. And in those moments where I catch myself drifting or starting to worry about the future or whatever, bring myself back. You know, whether I do a little bit of breathing exercise or just focus on my breath or whatever it may be, just bring myself back to the moment. And just every time, you know, every time. And sometimes I, I'm down the road far in the thought process before I realize like, oh shit, I'm like thinking about something and stressing out. Let me just come back, you know? But every time you just come back, you just come back. And when you decided to really get into this healing journey and the filming started and you started meeting these gurus and started these different practices, did you find the anxiety got worse before it got better? Because I'm assuming the anxiety was greatly in a subconscious area, kind of tucked away. And then you going through this practice, this healing journey, you're bringing it to the forefront. Did that, you know, cause turmoil and, and make things worse before they got better? Definitely. It definitely did. I remember parts of the time where I was in India, you know, in an ashram doing meditation, studying with Sri Prem Baba. Like I was, I would have like freak outs. Like my mind would go and I would feel really open and really sensitive and really weird. And I was like, what's going on? And I asked, like, I feel this is like, not good, you know? And he's like, well, this is what you wanted. You know, you wanted to heal and you have to bring this stuff to light in order to heal it. And at the same time, you know, all this healing work is, is a lot of it is a dismantling of our ego in a sense, you know, breaking apart our ego. And it's not like our ego is like a friend. It can be friendly if you can, you know, get to that point. But at the beginning, it's not a friendly thing that's like, okay, you're going to get rid of me. Cool. I'll just leave. All good. You know, no, it doesn't work like that. The more we try to dismantle it, the stronger it comes in and wants to take charge. So as we grow and as we evolve, the ego starts to slowly dissolve, but it's not going down without a fight, so to speak, you know? And in addition to that, all the different practices, yoga, meditation, ayahuasca, you know, cleanse, juice cleansing, chanting, all the different stuff that I was doing was all like really high intense ways to bring our emotions to the surface so that we can allow them to exist and feel the things that need to be felt. 
So, um, yeah, definitely things got more challenging before they got better. And you asked your therapist in the film a really interesting question about past traumas and if you needed to actually go back and relive those traumas to work your way through them. So talk about how she responded to you in that case, because I think that's really important for people to understand because somebody that's, you know, at the foot of the mountain thinking of doing the work and, and going through their traumas and sorting things out and getting to a better place, they might be thinking like, where do I begin? So talk about what that looks like. She said in the movie, I asked, do we need to go back to everything in our life that could have caused trauma in order to heal it? And she said, no, we don't. We need to deal with the things and feel the things as they arise. So, you know, doing a practice like yoga or doing a practice like meditation where we're just sitting in silence, things are going to come up, right? But we, we don't sit down and meditate and go like, okay, right now in this moment, I want to work on the time where my mom yelled at me and told me to go to my room. No, it doesn't work like that. You know, we sit there and we're meditating and things just come up. We feel emotions come up. And as they come up, it's really important to feel them and not put them back and suffocate them or cover them up or go do drugs or go get drunk or go hang out with a friend or, or that kind of stuff. Because then the stuff just stays there, stored in our body, stored in our psyche. So as things come up, feeling them to their completeness, to the point where they go away because they've been completely held and, and they kind of have the permission, so to speak, to be released. I think it's a very important thing that I learned in this whole process. So when one of those feelings come up in your own life, how long would you potentially have to sit with it? It's different. You know, it um, can be 30 minutes or if it's a massive issue, it can be, can be a long time. You know, um, like my anxiety, it took me years to, of sitting with it in order to really feel it and, and not have any panic attacks or anything like that, you know? A lot of these things, especially things that we do to ourselves, if we think about just diet, right, and health in general, if we spend like 30 years just eating shit and treating our body like absolute hell, we're not going to like sit and, and feel it in five minutes, be like totally healed. I mean, maybe there's miracles and stuff, right? But it takes time to unpack that. It takes time for those emotions to really feel safe and feel like they can be released. So I can't say like, you know, there's, it takes this much time or something like that. Every single thing is different. Every single person, circumstance, situation, they're all different. But I think if you do feel something like that come up, that it's great to feel like blessed, that it's such a miracle to be able to feel and to be able to um, allow those emotions to be there. And no matter how challenging it is or how uncomfortable it is, it's a doorway to something very, very beautiful. And obviously, this can be scary for people, especially if this is new. So how does somebody stay strong when, you know, this is a new thing for them, letting emotions come up and, and really feel them? You know, for me, I didn't do it on my own when it was new. You know, I, I had a therapist for 10 years, you know, and I think it is important to have a therapist or someone that you can really trust that, you know, that you can connect with. I mean, when people get over being addicts, they join AA or they have support groups and all this kind of stuff. So I think having support from other people is super important, especially if it's something that you're just, you know, you've been struggling with anxiety for many years and all of a sudden you're like, oh, you know, I really want to get into this. I really want to heal this part of myself. It's super important to have a supportive network or a mentor or a, um, or a therapist to, to help you in that process, especially in the beginning. You talked about the ego and the dismantling of it. I'm just curious what that process looks like. Is that come up and is that something we're working through when we do the practices like yoga and meditation or or how do we go about digging into that part for me the best way of digging into that part was a, a self-inquiry meditation practice which was kind of championed by ramana maharishi and um rupert spira who's in our documentary and uh, muji who's a kind of a guru spiritual teacher uh, and several other people it's this idea of just who am i you know and it's some of the most cliche saying of all time, right? Even in Zoolander, like he's looking in the puddle, you know, when he kind of is a model and it's not working for him anymore. And he looks in the puddle and he's like, who am I? You know, and, and then his agent calls him. He's like, what the hell are you talking about? Get back here, get back to work. But that question of like, who am I really? I think is, is a fundamental direct path to start unraveling the ego. Because it's basically, you know, for me, I think a big part of the anxiety and a big part of all the mental health issues that I was dealing with is based on the fact that I was identified with my thoughts. 
that I was identified with my ego, that I was completely identified with this physical form. Like, this is James. My thoughts, that's James. Like, there's no question, right? That's just me. Of course it's me. What else could it possibly be? But when you start this meditation practice and you start to be able to watch your thoughts, it's like, wait a second. Like, I must be something more than just my thoughts if I'm able to watch my thoughts. So who am I, really? And just going back and tracing that back, eventually the ego starts to like malfunction because it can't handle the program that you're putting in by constantly asking who you really are. So for me, um, that's a huge part and a huge way of, of dismantling the, the ego and, and really starting to look at it and, and look at it from a different perspective. We look at it from the outside. It's a part of us. You know, we're not going to deny that we have thoughts or everybody has thoughts. But to think that that's all that we are in our entirety is our thoughts will create a lot of problems. And the ayahuasca was a big part of the movie, a big part of your healing journey. When it came to working through the ego, was the ayahuasca experience part of that and helping you through that? 100%. I mean, the ayahuasca experience, we could spend like six hours just talking about the ayahuasca Let's get into it. Let's talk about it. I know (laughs) this was something you were afraid of doing beforehand. You know, you had to think about it a lot and, and you talk about how you actually started, I think, to get into a panic attack before you actually drank the ayahuasca. Every time. Every time. Okay. But first, let's make sure we address the ego question. Talk about specifically to start off how the ayahuasca let you get in and, and start to dismantle the ego. I think that's the, that's the ending point, but we can, we can start, we can Tarantino it and start with the ending and then loop back around if you want. Let's, um, let's have fun with it. Let's do it that way. <laughs> um, it was in the, the fourth night where I got to that point. So it took me three and a half ayahuasca ceremonies in order to get to the point where I could understand this. And those three and a half nights prior to that were the most challenging and difficult nights of my life by far. So in the three and a half waypoint in that ceremony you know to keep a long story short i was locked in the bathroom because i was literally freaking out and there was a little candle in the bathroom and so i locked myself in and i'm in the bathroom just completely like losing it and then i had this thought and i was like wait a second like i'm in peru i'm in the amazon jungle right now with the shipibo people and i'm trying to control this thing like i'm trying to control this medicine but i it's not working because these three nights I, I can't control it. And I had that thought and that awareness. And then I went back into the room where everybody else was and I laid down. And it, it was for me the first time in my life where I completely, completely, completely surrendered. I completely surrendered my ego. I completely let go of everything. I, you know, I had that feeling of like I was dead, like, wow, I'm dead. This is, this is it. But it was so beautiful and so amazing. It was totally okay. So I just completely surrendered my ego. I just completely surrendered my life and felt. And yet there was something that was still there, you know. And Alex Gray says it very well in the film because I'm talking to him and I'm sharing with him about my experience. I say, hey, I, I died in this ayahuasca experience. It was amazing. I was able to let go. I was able to surrender. And he said, well, even after you died, you were still there. And it's very interesting because after my ego wasn't there anymore, my thoughts weren't happening. And there was still something in me that was fully there and fully connected to everything and fully whole. And what is that? You know, what is that part of ourselves? So I think, um, you know, without getting too far ahead or anything, like that moment of just like completely letting go and completely surrendering to the now, to the present, to God, to life, to everything. That was the the moment where I really felt like what it was like to be free of, of suffering. Were you at total peace? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's so hard to explain, but it's um, it's beyond words, you know. Peace, you can use that. We can use the word peace, you know, because I think people can understand that in a sense. But for sure, yeah, I was just completely, just like nothing and everything at the same time, if that makes any sense. <laughs> it's definitely a mind warp. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing, though. It's beyond the mind. That's the point, you know. It's beyond the mind. That's why that's why it's so hard to explain and put into words because it's um the mind isn't in the mind's not existing in that place. It's just a complete feeling and a complete just connection. Yeah. It's a really beautiful experience. And after that experience on the fourth night, did that give you a feeling like there has to be something after death? Obviously it was a big moment for you. Did it did it change how you felt about death after that night? For sure. I think uh 
you know, I, I studied psychology now as well. I started to get into that um, in the last few years and, and all that kind of stuff. And I think, you know, I would go as far to say, and I think a lot of people would if you research it a bit, that the biggest fear that everybody has is the fear of death. And that's the root cause of all other fears. Now, I also tend to believe that there's also a fear of life. So I would say that there's two fears, you know, the fear of death and the fear of living. And those two fears, you can trace back any fear that you have. Like if you just start with the fear of, you know, not being enough. And then what happens if I'm not enough? Well, then people won't like me. Blah, 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 blah. If you trace them all back, they'll go to this fear of death. So if you work on that, you know, and if you can overcome that in a sense and accept that, I think it's very healing and it will heal a lot of the other fears. And so it completely did transform my fear of death. And it made me um, definitely think that death is an absolutely beautiful, uh, amazing, natural part of life. And it's nothing to be afraid of, for sure. How freeing that must be. Definitely. Talk more about the fear of life. That's not something I've heard of before. Fear of living is like, um, I felt like that. I had to deal with that a lot in therapy. And, you know, it's this fear of like, if I actually succeed, how are the people around me going to feel? You know, if you have maybe some friends around and stuff that, that maybe aren't successful in financially or spiritually or in any way that you want to be successful or that you feel that you're doing, it starts to feel weird. You know, like if you're the, the successful guy in the circle and everybody else isn't and they're kind of like throwing these passive aggressive comments at you or, like they're bummed about their life, but you're like, and you're like really happy with your life and you feel really great inside for a variety of reasons, but you have to kind of dumb that down a little bit to fit in with the people around you. Then you start to develop this, like this fear of, of greatness, this fear of like living life to the fullest. And it's something that I really had to, to work a, a lot around because I definitely did that. I was definitely like, Oh, like, uh, you know, I feel weird, you know, with success and I feel weird with being, you know, in this space that I feel in meditation. And so the mind comes in, even when you're doing good and it tries to trick you like, oh, you can't, you can't be doing this and doing that. You can't be so great and blah, 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 blah. And a lot of people, including myself, self-sabotage themselves from living the life that they want to live because they're afraid of, of shining. They're afraid of becoming their truest, ultimate, most beautiful self because it's also the unknown you know it's like what would happen if i achieved everything that i wanted to achieve you know what would happen if i was fully present all the time what would happen if i had the relationship i wanted the job i wanted the businesses or all the stuff that we want what would happen if i actually achieved all of that stuff and, and um it can be a scary thought well in a small way this reminds me of what we talked about early in the conversation when you were at the bar drinking the green juice and other people were doing the shots of tequila where you were, you know, in a different spot than your friends at the time. Yeah, I mean, people, I, I've done it, you've done it, everybody's done it, you know, like, like when we're younger, we pick on the kid that's smarter, or, you know, the, the kid that the misfit kid gets picked on a lot, because, you know, or, or if someone's really smart, or really good looking, or really connected, or whatever, people might make jokes at that person, and they're like little jokes, and you're like in a friend circle, so it doesn't really feel like much. But actually, it hurts people on the inside, you know, and it's like, whoa, and, and people do this because they feel insecure in themselves. And they're, they're looking for security by putting other people down. And putting other people down is, you know, if we allow ourselves to be put down, then we're preventing ourselves from reaching our goals. And, you know, as you've had success in your own life over the years, how have you navigated this? Just, you know, my circle of friends changed completely. My job changed. And just really putting up boundaries, I think, is super important. Not allowing that to happen. If someone makes fun of you, you just smash them right in the moment. Say, hey, this is not okay with me. You know, I'm not okay with that kind of thing. I'm not okay with those kind of jokes. Like, if you're not happy with your life, that's fine. But don't take it out on me, you know? And just, like, being really sharp and really, like, hey, like... And then, the, the, you know, it happens and you and you have different friends and you grow and evolve and different environments different places things just kind of shift for you as you shift you know we're really supported and when we make these changes in our lives you know the universe god they, they come together to help you and to support you in that path and those changes so i think if people you know just not to be afraid just not to have that fear and just 
you know, shut that down. You know, when people come in with that kind of stuff and negativity and all those kind of things, we don't need those kind of influences in our lives, you know? Life's too short. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's come back to ayahuasca and let's come back to the beginning of that journey. We didn't actually talk about what ayahuasca is. I'm sure a lot of the listeners have heard of it and have an idea, but talk about specifically where you went in Peru to do that and what that entailed, like what is involved in making ayahuasca tea and take us through back to the beginning. Okay. So we went to a place called the Temple of the Way of Light. It's uh, about an hour and a half ride up the Amazon from Iquitos, Peru. Uh, and it's an incredible place. The people there who share the medicine are traditional Shipibo healers, and they've been doing it for generations and generations and generations. And they're super knowledgeable. I think the main teaching, you know, well, I, well ayahuasca is, like scientifically, ayahuasca itself is actually a vine. And the vine um, is the ayahuasca vine, and then there's a leaf. So you brew these two things together, and one of them is the DMT, and the other one is the thing that allows the DMT to stay in your system for an extended period of time. It's called an MAO inhibitor. So you mix those two things together, and then you have this DMT experience for you know eight to twelve hours. And um, I don't know if it's a hundred percent true or not, but I've heard so many people say it. There's two times in our life where DMT naturally occurs in our bodies, and it's when we're born and when we die. And I don't know if that's a hundred percent true, but I've heard so many people say it that I think that it's probably true. <laughs> well, it correlates to your death experience on ayahuasca. Yeah, it does for sure. So one of the main things that I that I learned from the local people there and from the temple of the Tree of Light was that ayahuasca is not a recreational thing. You know, it's not something, it's like, oh, what are you doing this weekend? I don't know, I'm bored. Maybe I'm going to go drink some ayahuasca with my friends, hang out, you know? For me, it shouldn't be looked at in that type of way. It should be looked at and respected as a very, very, very powerful medicine, a very ancient healing remedy. And I think that that's the type of respect and admiration and mentality that we need to go into it with. Because it's it for some people maybe for, for me it was a very very difficult challenging experience and it really brings up a lot of stuff and it's like a full power test of like okay how centered can you be how much can you watch what's happening even when it feels like completely real and and all this kind of stuff you know how how much can you let go so I think you know for me the main message is like ayahuasca is if you've tried other things and nothing's working and you're still struggling you have ptsd or you're suicidal or you're anxious you go to a place like this where you can really be supported and held in your experience and you go to it thinking like i'm trying this medicine to heal myself and not a lot of people do that you know even in in peru on the street they sell ayahuasca and syringes like you know you can pay 10 bucks and get like a syringe of ayahuasca and there's people like sitting behind the trash cans like injecting the stuff on the street corners or they're out at nightclubs and drinking and it's like, holy fuck, like what's going on? You know, this is a, a really, really, um, a really much needed medicine. And I just really hope that it, it gets treated that way. And how did you go about for the film finding a safe place, the ideal place to go and do it? I, uh, we had heard at our yoga teacher training from a couple of people who went to this place. And then I went online and had like amazing reviews and it's very hard to be able to film ayahuasca stuff with like traditional healers and stuff like that. So I called Matthew and Matthew's the, the founder of the temple. And um, I said, hey, here's what we're doing. Here's what I'm going through. I'd really love to come out there and film. And we had hours and hours of conversation together before he agreed to even letting us come out. And even after he even said like, hey, I don't even know if you're going to be able to film when you get out here. We have to check the vibe of the healers and we have to see. You know, there was 11 or 12 other people with us on, on the retreat. We have to see if they're okay with it. And it's a very sensitive thing. Like I said, there's people there with cancer and a lot of other things. They're going there and trying to heal. So they don't necessarily want cameras around and all that kind of stuff. So we picked the best place that we could find. And and we talked to them and shared our story. And luckily, they allowed us to come there and to to experience this and to, and to film one of the ceremonies. Um, you know, everybody who was there filming with us was also doing the ayahuasca. The only night they didn't do it was the night that we filmed, but we had all done, you know, four ceremonies together as a, as a crew before we even attempted to, to film one of them. And personally, when you were back in your days when you're doing heavy drugs, did you have a lot of psychedelic experience coming into doing ayahuasca? You know, I did when I was younger, I did LSD quite a lot of times. And, um, when I lived in Amsterdam, I did mushrooms a few times. 
I wouldn't say a lot, but I think I maybe had like 20, you know, 15 to 20 psychedelic experiences or something like that coming up to the ayahuasca, but nothing can prepare you for the ayahuasca experience. They're not in the same realm, eh? You know, I, I feel like mushrooms that there's, you know, there's um, psilocybin has some similarities in a sense, but the power of ayahuasca and the spirit of ayahuasca are totally different. So it's definitely a, a very, very different experience for sure. Now I'm going to take another quick break from my chat with James to give a shout out to our show partner, Sun Warrior. One of my favorite smoothie ingredients is the Warrior Blend Organic Protein from Sun Warrior. It's an easily digestible, nutrient-filled superfood perfect for anyone who wants to amplify their health and fitness. It contains yellow peas that have been fermented, goji berry, hemp seed, and coconut, and comes in five flavors, but in our home we love vanilla and stick with it. It's organic, vegan, not just gluten-free but grain-free, and it's keto and paleo-friendly. And as a listener of the show, you get 20% off your Sun Warrior purchase by going to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash sunwarrior. Again, that URL is ultimahealthpodcast.com slash sunwarrior. On top of that, if you spend $50 or more, you get free shipping. Looking for a high-quality plant-based protein powder to add to your smoothies? Warrior Blend from Sun Warrior has you covered. Now I'm going to give a shout-out to our other show partner, Perfect Keto. I finally got to try the keto cookies from Perfect Keto, and they're incredible. They're delicious, clean, and indulgent with only 4 grams of net carbs per pack, which is 2 cookies. The perfect treat for your cookie cravings. They come in 3 flavors, which are all great, but peanut butter are my favorite, then chocolate chip, then double chocolate. Having healthy peanut butter cookies is so nostalgic for me, as it reminds me of making peanut butter cookies with my mom as a kid. As a listener of the show, you get 20% off your Perfect Keto purchase by going to ultimahealthpodcast.com slash perfectketo. Again, that URL is ultimahealthpodcast.com slash perfectketo. Perfect Keto products ship worldwide. If you live in the U.S. and you spend over $29, you get free shipping. Craving something sweet after lunch or dinner? Indulge in some keto cookies without guilt. And now back to my chat with James. And you mentioned how challenging those those first few nights were. How do you psych yourself up, you know, night two, night three, night four? How do you psych yourself up each night to be able to go back, you know, into that under the medicine and go through that whole experience? Because you know how challenging it is. I don't think I was psyched up at all. <laughs> I went into it like super scared and shaking and crying and having anxiety attacks and stuff every night before I took it. But I just felt like I had to do it. So, But you had to will yourself up. Obviously, that's, you knew what you were getting into after the first night. And it must have took a lot of willpower to push through and continue to, to go through the, the plant medicine journeys. And I think the filming helped me with it, or else I might have chickened out, to be honest. You know, I'm there like with all this crew making a documentary. I can't bail. I can't leave and go home. I have to do this, you know. And I think that's one of the cool things about the filmmaking. It was like, having that thing there of like you have to do this there's a cameras here and you know so making the movie was a big support system to me as well in a sense and for a moment of you and mark coming up with the idea for the film to completion how many years did the whole thing take in february it will be five years and we took about a year off in the middle to integrate things and to let all the information we you know came up with stew and digest and all that kind of thing but you know, I know people make documentaries and they shoot, they film in like 17 days or 21 days and then they edit in three months and in six months total they have a film. But this is very different, you know, because it's like a spiritual journey and we're trying to heal anxiety, like very like deep rooted anxiety. And it's not something you can say like, okay, I have 21 days, let's go fix our anxiety and make a film about it. You know, it's something that needs time and you learn these like really deep, powerful teachings and you know, I would say my ayahuasca experience took at least a year to a year and a half to, for me to fully integrate and understand in my life, like what had actually just happened. To me. So these, these things are, are very deep and, and they require time, you know. And throughout that whole five years, were you in any romantic relationships? Did you have a partner at all? Yeah, I did. I had uh, two. Okay. Had two that wasn't partners. shown. It was shown from a solo perspective in the documentary. I'm just curious if you had that support and somebody along with you traveling and, and going through these experiences or at least witnessing your profound healing journey? For the first little bit, the first six months of the, there was, I did have a girlfriend with me and I would, um, it didn't work out well. Like it wasn't the place to, to have someone with, like you said, you know, when we're bringing these things to the surface, it gets harder before it gets better. 
So uh, definitely at times, I, at the beginning, I wasn't the nicest person to be around and we were making each other react and it was just all this stuff was coming up and I didn't have the space I needed in order to be able to really fully heal and, and integrate these things. So after that relationship ended, I waited a while and then I met a girl and fell in love, but she didn't come with me on any of the other stuff um, except for maybe like one thing. And um, I had my space and I was free and I was supported and stuff like that for sure. But I think I do think there's a huge value in doing these things alone and not not alone where you're not supported, but like having the space to be able to do what you need to do and having if you are in a relationship, someone who's fully on board and fully supports like, yeah, I'm really proud of you. I know this is what you want to do. You need to do this. However, I can support you in this healing journey. I'm fully there for you. I think that's the mentality that, you know, there needs to be underlying a relationship. And are you still in a relationship with that that second girl? Yeah, I yeah. am. Nice. Yeah. So another relationship I really want to talk to is the one between you and your father. And I found this to be such a powerful inclusion within the film. And I think the way I've heard you explain it in another interview, you had to sit down with your dad and filmed it for the movie. And then that got broken up and you, you inserted different clips throughout the movie. So talk about when you had that conversation with your dad, what he knew at that point. And how scary that was for you. At that point, it was pretty much when we were done traveling. We did the ayahuasca already. We did the yoga. We did meditation trainings. And we were kind of done. And uh, the whole idea was just we, we were in this diner. And it was like, hey, we got three hours worth of batteries and, you know, card, you know, SD cards and stuff. We can, we can handle three hours of talking. So all we want you to do is just sit down with your dad and just tell him everything that you've done this entire trip. And I was like, okay. So I sat down with my dad and for three hours shared with him everything. And even the fact that I had anxiety, like, you know, I grew up with my father and my mother and we were all in the same house and stuff. And I never told him my whole life that I was suffering with anxiety. You know, it wasn't something that was okay. And in, 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 so to speak in, in my family. So even telling him that was, was challenging and, and trying to get him to, to understand in a sense what I was going through. And trying to share and connect deeply with someone who I love very much uh, was a very, very difficult, um, very challenging thing to do, especially with cameras there and all that kind of stuff, you know? That's what I was going to say. You had that extra element of being in a diner plus having the cameras on. Did you guys clear the diner out so you could have the conversation or were there people coming in and out at the time? We cleared it out. We were, we were able to, like, there was there's specific places in New York that you could rent for like a block of time. Um, so we rented that little space for a three hour window and it was just us and like a waitress in there. And, uh, and that was pretty much it. Yeah. So after you go through this with your dad and get into the details of what you've been doing, did you feel the sense of relief and lightness having that conversation, you know, out in the open? Yeah, I did. And I, it was like, you know, he came, we were in New York, he flew to New York and hung out with us. It was my birthday, I think too, like the day before or the day after something like that. So he came there and we hung out together and um, it definitely brought my father and I closer together for sure. And it definitely seemed like at least early on in the conversation, I'm not sure the sequencing of how it was recorded with how it was laid into the film, but he really, you know, wasn't getting it. He was kind of being dismissive and kind of had a wall up as you were being really open and pouring things out, how challenging was that for you? It was definitely a challenge. Yeah, it's hard, you know, I th and I think I feel a lot of people um, deal with this. One of the main things that people say to me uh, when they see the film is they've experienced these things with their father as well or their mother or whatever. So I think it's also a generational thing, like probably, you know, what, if we have kids in, in 50 years from now or whatever, the stuff that we experience in our generation and stuff like that, they're going to think like we're weird and they're going to try to communicate with us about something. And maybe we're going to be like, what the fuck are you talking about? Like, ah, you know what I mean? And maybe there'll be some new mental health stuff, you know, and we'll be like, what do you have this? Come on. You know, like how my dad feels about me having anxiety. So I think there's definitely a generational gap there for sure. And at the same time, like we all fundamentally want our parents to love us and hear us and be there for us, no matter what it is that we say, or no matter what it is that we're going through. And if we don't have that support from them, we start to look for it elsewhere, you know, from a very early age. But I do think overall that having that conversation with my dad and me getting older and him getting older is, you know, he's still definitely fixing his ways 100%. You know, we just drove in a van together. 
across the country for the last five or six days. So I see it firsthand. But um, yeah, it definitely brought us closer together. Anything interesting come up over the travels that you recently did together? You know, I don't. I would get so much into it, but things come up all the time. You know, he says stuff that triggers me, then I say stuff that trigger him. But it's that thing, you know, where I was talking about earlier in terms of learning how to put up boundaries for ourselves. And when people are coming in too much or saying things that just aren't cool, just saying like, hey, look, like, I don't want to talk about this with you. Like, it's not cool how you're treating me. And I say those things now, which I didn't used to say. And it's, it was hard for me to like start that, especially with my dad, this powerful man that I looked up to my entire life, to be able to kind of shut him down and say, hey, that's not okay with me. is a difficult thing to do, but I actually think that the more that I do it, the more respect I gain from him in turn, because he sees like, wow, like this kid's like growing up, he's got things that he's okay with and isn't okay with and, and stuff like that. So it's very important to hold boundaries and especially with the people that are closest to us. And I think another piece of that too, is as we learn new things and take on these adaptations and in the health and wellness space, say it be meditation or your ayahuasca experience, whatever it is, things that work for us and we adopt them and, and transform, we want to share them with our loved ones, our family, our friends, because we want to, you know, first of all, let them know we're doing well, but also potentially give them the opportunity to dig into these things and, and transform themselves. So I think that's another whole angle. And I'm sure somebody like yourself that's, you know, gone into vegetarian diet and open alchemy and just you have this cafe that's you know helping people become healthy and you've had this transformation you want to help instill that in the loved ones around you but it's it's a fine balance because you also don't want to bombard them and push them away and put walls up so how have you been able to navigate that yeah it's a really good question i think to start off with ramdas once said something along the line of uh, if you think you're enlightened go back home and spend a week with your parents and I think that's a really good point, you know, because we, we go around, go to these places, whether you go to India or whether you go to a meditation studio or whether you just watch a talk or whatever, and you feel really good. You're like, wow, I feel great. Like, this is working. Like, no worries. Life is good. And then you go back home or you go back to work or you go back to whatever, and you're the people around you are in that same bubble, that same situation that they were in before you grew in the sense that you grew in. And then you're confronted with that again. And it's like, whoa, like what's going on? You know, and I think that's really interesting. And that's why we put this as a thread throughout the film, because it's not just like a guy going on a spiritual journey, but it's a spiritual journey. But then he's trying to integrate it into his daily life. He's trying to have these conversations with his dad. And I remember, you know, when I first became a vegetarian, coming back, and dad, you got to try this. Like, mom, oh, vegetarian is the greatest thing in the world. Like, ah, oh, you know what I mean? Like people in the corners, like be a vegetarian, like trying to force it on other people. but that doesn't work. And from, you know, my experience, and I can use the vegetarian thing as an example, because my dad actually did become a vegetarian for a year, you know, maybe five years ago or something like that. But it wasn't because I told him to do it. It, be, it was because I did it. And I think that's such an important thing. Like if you really want the people around you to grow and to change and to try to have these understandings that we have, we have to fully embody it. And when we fully embody these things, the people around us can feel it and they can see the change and they can feel your happiness grow and they can see that you're growing as a human being and they'll want some of that. They'll be like, you know, what's going on? Like, what, why? You, how did you lose 25 pounds? Like, oh, it's a vegetarian thing, you know, whatever. And as they ask, we give a little bit more information. Oh, you're interested? Yeah, cool. Check out this book, you know, or wow, you've seen, you don't have any, any panic attacks in the last three years. You know, how did you do that? Well, I've, you know, I've been doing these meditation practices and super helpful. And then people ask, oh, what, what meditation are you doing? How, how do you do that? Like, you know, I think for me, that's more of the way is to like live these things and to be this, this way. And, and if we're like that, people around us will naturally be um, inspired in the sense that maybe they want to try it out too. And as they ask, we're open. Oh, yeah, sure. I'll share that idea with you or that technique or whatever. Yeah, no problem. It's a lot different than if we're running around like, you need to do this and you should be like that. And why aren't you changing? And why aren't you growing? And I think those approaches are drastically different. Totally agree with you, but it's easier said than done. And I think a lot of times, like I've had a similar experience, many similar experiences. I had a period of my life when I was plant-based too and wanted to share with everybody and I think you almost have to go through one of those experiences where you're being a cheerleader for something you've, you know, found and it's had a profound impact on you 
to realize that that way doesn't work. You can't will people into making changes to the people you love, even though you want to, and it comes from a good place. You just, again, like you're saying, you just have to live it and it has to come from the person. It has to come at the right time for them. For sure. Definitely. And you're right. Maybe it is, I say this because I have lived it and you say it because you've lived it, you know, in that sense. But the truth of the matter is we can't change anybody else except for ourselves. And even changing ourselves is very hard. So the idea that we think we can change somebody else is, you know, it's pretty much impossible. The only thing we can do is really grow on an individual level and, and, and that in itself inspires other people. Like even right now, we're having this conversation and, you know, I'm not like cheerleading my movie or telling everybody like, you have to meditate or like the answer for your anxiety is meditation and do these five steps. And after you do those five steps, your anxiety is going to be gone. It's not like that. It's like just sharing my experience here and just sharing the things that I've been through in my life. And if people are interested and they hear this talk and they want to message me and share their experience and ask questions, I'm super open to that kind of thing. Yeah, it's just, it's a different approach. And I think you have to go through both of them, you know, in order to see that. But we know, right, when we're young, like our parents tell us like, don't drink, don't, you know, don't mind, we're very overprotective. You can't do this and you can't do that. First thing I did was go out and do all of it times 10, you know, because we were told not to and we were told what to do. But if we lead by example and we're led by example, I think we we gravitate towards that. And has your dad seen the finished film yet? Yeah. My dad did see the finished film. Were you with him when he watched it? The first time I wasn't because I was traveling for so long and he was really wanting to watch it. And I was like, Dad, I, I would like to watch it with you the first time. I was like, no, blah, blah, blah. So, okay. so I let him see it and we talked for a while afterwards. And um, he still doesn't think that I have that I had anxiety. He doesn't, still doesn't think anxiety is a real thing. He, he was kind of giving me a hard time for putting myself out there so much and being so vulnerable and, and just stuff that you would think that my dad would say. He said it all. Let's just put it that way. <laughs> but I think it also did change him a lot to see that there. You know, we've had conversations. You know, he asked me like, "Oh, did I not do a good job raising you? Like, you know, why were you suffering so much?" So it, that those kind of questions came up from him seeing the film that really opened the doorway to us having deeper conversations and and. Uh, in our relationship. And like you talked about earlier, the film forced you to do things that you might not have done otherwise. And that conversation with your dad is probably a great example. And I'm sure it sounds like that's transformed that relationship in so many ways. Just something else I'm sure you're probably grateful for, for this film. 100% definitely transformed the relationship with my dad. And with my brother too, I actually had a uh, a very deep, very healing, multi-hour conversation with my brother. And we were going to put that in the film as well because it was very, very amazing and very beautiful and very healing for both of us. But as after we filmed, not Mark, but one of the other guys who was working with us, he was carrying the laptop and he had the uh, the hard drive that had the stuff on it. And he was it was like about to start backing up in many different places. So we had it and it fell off the computer and broke. So that whole conversation, and we spent a lot of like a lot of energy and money trying to recover it because there's like services that will help you recover like broken. No one could fix it. So that conversation was just meant for me and my brother to have in that moment, but um, was also a very deep and, and very healing conversation. And was there any other footage on the hard drive? Well, yeah, I think there was. There were some B-roll like shots of the city, and 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 I don't really know to be honest. Maybe they lied to me. <laughs> Uh, and that was an accepting thing. At first, I was like, no. And my brother was so bummed because he flew to New York and he was there and he had to leave work and he couldn't really come. And, you know, we were delaying the conversation because I was sick at the time. And and then finally, we made it happen. And, and then, like, it was a beautiful, amazing conversation. Everybody was like, oh, my God, this is going to be so great to share with people. And then we, it broke. So, yeah. It just shows that we only have so much control. Exactly. So how much footage did you guys end up shooting in that five years? A couple hundred hours of stuff, for sure. And so many hard drives. Like if you saw the amount of hard drives, because we shot everything in like a red camera and 6K and like raw. So the amount of footage we had and the amount of terabytes was just like overwhelming. And watching that final cut of the film, did you have a lot of say actually what went into the final cut? For sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, I wasn't day to day in the editing room because I really trusted the people that we worked with. And I know that I did the best that I could. So they would, you know, after a couple of weeks, be like, James, we have a version together. Let's watch it and make notes. And we kind of 
oh yeah, and we made notes and then they give another version and then we'd make notes together and it kind of evolved in that way. Anything from all that raw footage you can think back to that watching the final cut, you really wish that was in there? The brother piece for sure. And there's so much, like we did a whole section. We went to Nepal and we, uh, a friend of mine's amazing guy and he was actually on Everest when the earthquake hit Nepal years ago. And he ran down like the, the, from Everest base camp, he ran down the mountain to see like complete devastation of what the earthquake did. And he changed his life into service and he started rebuilding schools for kids in Nepal. So we went to Nepal and helped them rebuild schools and studied in monasteries as while we were there and had this insane car ride, like in this Nepalese mountain with like, it was raining and the roads were like this big and there were no railings. And it was, it was this like crazy moment and we had it all on film and stuff like that. And it didn't make the cut. And also I got to go do a silent retreat with Muji in Portugal and he invited me to the ashram afterwards and we got to spend a whole day filming together. But it was so late in the filming process that we couldn't really put it in properly. But it was such a beautiful moment. I really wish that that also could have been in the film, um, which we unfortunately didn't get to put in. But there was so much good stuff. You know, like I talked to Russell Brand for two hours and Gary Weber, the guy who's at the table sitting across from me having those beautiful chats. We had a three hour conversation, you know, and it's only in the film for like six minutes. So there's so much amazing understanding and learning that came from all those conversations. And you know, unfortunately, the film's 95 minutes, so we just had to put the most key powerful moments in it that would help to tell the story of, of what we wanted to tell. And is there a reason not to extend that to two hours? Like 95 minutes, is that kind of the sweet spot in documentaries? Or Yeah, I mean, it just from a lot of people we heard to keep it like an hour and a half. And it, we had longer cuts that were two hours and all this kind of stuff, but it kind of dragged on. And it's not like, a, you know, also we filmed it in kind of a timeless way. That was our goal. It's not like these other films that you see on Netflix and stuff that are just like bam, 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 and animations and fast music and, you know, all that kind of stuff. It's like a slow film because you really need to watch it and like understand what's being said. It's very dense. So, I think it would have been more difficult for people to be able to sit through it if it was two or three hours long because it's like so thick in information, you know? So we tried to cut it back and tell this story and this message in as short of an amount of time as we possibly could so that we could hold people's attention, yeah. And I did notice while watching it that slower pace that you talk about, that artistic feel to it. And I think that is very fitting given the subject matter of you know, things like yoga, meditation, being present, slowing down. So it just, it all fit very nice. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Talk about the first time you watched the movie, whenever that was, the final cut, because this is five years of your life. This is a big time investment. A lot of energy went into it. Where were you watching it? And talk about what that experience was like. The first time we rented like an old theater in Colorado in Estes Park. It's like one of the oldest theaters in the country. And we had like 20 or 25 people come together and watch it. And um, it was just a really beautiful experience to see my, it was like a meditation, you know, because I'm watching myself go through all of this stuff. And every time I see it, I feel it, you know, like when I'm the scene where I'm screaming or when I see the ayahuasca. So I see these moments and I, I kind of relive them in a sense, you know, and then seeing how other people, I also feel a bit uncomfortable because I'm putting myself out there so much, you know. So sometimes when I'm watching it in the theater or whatever, I like look around and see how other people are like reacting to it. and. You know, it really bothers me when I look around, and I see other people like on their phones the whole time, you know, like I was at a film festival and I don't think the guy next to me knew that I was the one in the film or whatever. And he was just the entire time just like texting. And I was just like, oh, man, <laughs> but it just let go and surrender to it. You know what I mean? So those different things happen every time we watch it. But in general, it's really cool. and I feel really grateful, really, really fortunate. And I'm definitely coming from a a super privileged position. And I completely recognize that to be able to travel around the world and, and to have these experiences. Well, it's a beautiful film. I highly recommend people go and give it a watch. Chasing the Present. And it came out on September 29th. I think it was, you had to buy it initially when it came out on, on iTunes. Still do. It's still for sale. Yeah. Okay. And by the time this comes out, I think it's going to be available. Is it just the first week that you have to buy it? Starting October 6th, it's available for rent. Okay. So other than people checking out the film, James, how can they connect with you after the show? Our website is chasingthepresent.com. Uh, you can also reach out to me directly on Instagram. I read all my messages and respond to everybody. It's james.sebastiano is my Instagram. 
or you can email me at james at chasing the present.com. All right. That's all going to be linked up over in the show notes. Any final thoughts you want to part with? No, I just thank you so much for your time. I really enjoyed talking to you. It was really great. I, I love doing these things because I get to relive these experiences and express myself and, and share where I'm coming from. So thank you for giving me that opportunity. Um, it was really a pleasure to connect with you. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed this. Thank you. I know you got a lot going on. You got the family together. And you must have, like I said at the beginning, so much going on with the release of this film. And I just definitely want people to go check it out. Give it a watch. It's really well put together, inspirational. You're going to help transform a lot of people. So thank you so much. And James, we'll keep in touch. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you, too. I really loved that conversation with James. I hope you did, too. He's just so real, so open, so vulnerable through the movie and through our conversation. So I hope you loved it. We'd love to hear what you thought of it over on Instagram. You can tag james.sebastiano and Ultimate Health Podcast, and you can take a screenshot of the player as you're listening to the show, take a video of yourself for a photo, and we'd love to connect with you over there. For full show notes, head over to ultimatehealthpodcast.com 375. There's links there to everything we discussed today and so much more. Be sure and check those out. And before I let you go, I want to give some love to my editor and engineer, Jay Sanderson over at podcasttech.com. Jay, thank you so much for all you do. And this week's fun fact is that I got myself a pair of Luna sandals. And I'm a big flip-flop wearer, which I know aren't good for my feet. So this is a big step for me. And my friend Alan has been telling me about these sandals for a long time. And the great thing about these Luna sandals is they're actually good for your feet. So I'm super excited about my upgrade. Have an awesome week. I'll talk to you soon. Wishing you ultimate health.